Come on, welcome to Christian Worship Center, our midweek service this week. Can we get into some worship? I want to thank those that are joining us online. Come on, with every hand lifted high across the room, let's come together in agreement. God, we pray that you would have your way tonight. We're grateful. We come expecting to hear more of you. We come expecting, Lord, to, to leave with more of you. We pray, Lord, that you would have your way tonight. Rest on us this evening. Rest on us this evening, God. We give you glory. We give you praise, Jesus. Come on, continue to reverence his name right where you are across the room. Those of you that are at home, let's just enter in. Let's usher in the presence of God, right? He belongs in your home. He belongs where you are. He belongs within you. Lord, you belong here, God. We, we, we're we here because of you. We want more of you, Jesus. You're all that we long for, God. You're everything that we need, Jesus. Come on, lift your heart to him this evening. We give you glory, God. We give you glory, God. No one greater than you, Jesus. No one greater than you, God. You're everything we need, God. You're everything we need, Jesus. We praise you, Father. Come on, worship him. I'm calling on the God of Jay. Whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me. Come on, make it your cry tonight. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. Hey. I'm calling on the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the Lord. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David, who made a shepherd boy courageous. I may not face Goliath, but I've got my own giants. Oh God, my God, I God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Hey. Oh, rock, oh, rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. See, my God. Oh, God, my God, I need you. Oh, God, my God. Providing them, you are. 
providing now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You moved in power then. God moved in power now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were a healer then. You are a healer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were a savior then. You are a savior now. You are the same God. You are the same God. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Hey, oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing. name come on we all say come on you could do better than that give God a shout of praise this evening the air fire the person right next to you you may be seated as you take your seats draw your attention to the screen see what we have coming up this week on CWC Bay Area Connect welcome CWC I'm Araceli and you're watching Connect For gathering with us today. We are so excited to worship with you on this blessed day. 
CWC's annual Church in the Park will be taking place on Sunday, September 11th. This event will be held at Lake Cunningham Park in the Cypress Pavilion picnic area with service starting at 1030. Please stay tuned for upcoming details. Bay Area Leadership Academy will be starting up classes on September 13th. We will be offering two classes via Zoom, with the first on Principles of Christian Growth, taught by Pastor Nick Belosky, and the second class on the Life of Christ, taught by Pastor Dan Vera. For more information or to be placed on the registration list, we ask that you please call into the church office. And that's it for now. I'm Araceli, and you're watching Connect. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Oh, it's so good to have you in the house this evening. I know some of you might be tired, but we are in the presence of God. Amen. Amen. Come on, we need to wake up. We're going to have a blessed time. I know Pastor Nick has a good word for us. At this time, if you are here for the first time, would you do us a favor? Would you raise your hand so we could acknowledge you in the house? Is there any first-time guests, first-time visitors in the house? I see Miriam pointing at somebody. Give her a round of applause. Amen. I know it's, it's kind of hard to raise your hand. Our ushers want to get you a card. Uh, if you could fill that card out following service, we have a table in the back. We'd like to meet you and give you a gift as well. Amen. Give her another round of applause. Those of you online, if you're here for the first time, we just want to say welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us here at CWC, our midweek service. If you can do us a favor, you can put VIP in the comment section, or you can text the word VIP to 408-340-7703. We just want to say thank you for joining us. Amen. Amen. With that being said, uh, who's ready to give this evening? All right, let's stand to our feet as we prepare our hearts. As we're doing so, I just want to say thank you to all those faithful givers online. We just want to say thank you for being faithful in your tithing and your offering, and we want to say thank you. Listen, Deuteronomy 8, 17 and 18 says this. It says, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this well for me. Come on, has anybody ever felt like that, right? This is my money. I earned it. Right. I, I'm the one that worked for it. It's my check. You can't you can't tell me what to do with my money. Right. Sometimes we can have that attitude. It, it's mine and it belongs to me. Rightfully so. You 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 made you made your living. Right. You went and put in the hours. But the scripture goes on to say this. It says, instead, remember that the Lord, your God, gives you the strength to make a living. Come on. We can't forget where our strength comes from. God gives us the strength. He gives us the ability. He gives us the the ability to understand to do our jobs, right? So when we give of our tithe and our offering, we are acknowledging that our source is God and God alone. And we're saying, thank you, Lord, that you give me the strength and the ability to produce this wealth. Let's, let's not ever forget that he's the one that blesses us with the ability to make a living. Amen? Amen. Let's make our tithe, our declaration this, this uh, evening. This is my tithe. Is my tithe. With, it, my with it, I give God my best. I activate my God covenant with my first fruits. I expect checks in the mail, refunds and rebates, promotions at work, healing in my body, bonuses and blessings. Blessings cometh unto me now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, that you've given us the strength and the ability to make a living for ourselves and our families, Lord. Let us not forget, Lord, that you are the source, Lord, of everything that we have. God, and as we give back, Lord, we're giving back in gratitude and in recognition, Lord, that you are the source, God. So I pray tonight, Lord, everybody that gives tonight, that you would continue to give them strength, that you would continue to give them the ability, Lord, to produce the wealth that they have, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. How's everyone doing this evening? Come on, how you doing tonight? I just want to uh, just welcome our online audience as well. Thank you so much for joining us, our online campus. I don't want to call you an audience. You are our campus. And so uh, recognizing a few people here, uh, we want to recognize, uh, let me see here, Lonnie Rivera. Lonnie Rivera, thank you for watching tonight. I see Sister Carrie Gonzalez on. Uh, Bonnie is on. We have Johnny Mizey. Forgive me if I messed up your last name. Uh, <clears throat> Brother Barry, 
I see you're watching. Um, Sister Norma, thank you. And I think I see Sister Ange is on right now as well. So all the way from uh, their, uh, their, their suffering there um, in, <laughs> on their vacation. I just want to welcome everyone tonight. Listen, I'm so honored. Tonight I get to close out our, relation, our relationship series. Um, tonight is going to be an amazing thing because um, tonight we're going to talk about people that we need in our life. Right. If there's people that we need in our life, how many know that there's people that we need to get out of our life? Right. You should have got a little more excited for that one there. Right. We need people in our life. But then there's also people that we have in our life that probably aren't a, the best fit for us right now. And so I want to encourage you, if you're not taking notes or you don't have anything, make sure you get out your phone, snap some of the, you know, the, the pictures, uh, the uh, slides that'll be up here. Write some notes down. Why? Because it, it does no good for you to hear something, go home and forget it, right? It's important that you take notes in, in church. That's why in school they told you to take notes because you need to remember. It's a reminder to yourself of what was being taught. And so if we're going to get further in life, we have to make sure that we're doing everything on our part it's not the pastor's job to just give you. You have to open up your mouth and you have to begin to eat. Write down your own notes so that you know exactly what you need to do in the time that you need it. How many of you guys ever wrote down a note, um, you know, maybe a while ago you, you were taking notes on something and then a situation came up and you're like, hold on, I know I have something on that. You scroll back through your phone and right then and there, it didn't happen in that moment, but you took notes, uh, you know, a few weeks, a month ago, and all of a sudden you have an answer to a situation that you're going through in the moment. That's why we ask you to take notes. So make sure that you are taking notes tonight. But we're going to talk about the people that we need in life. So ending our relationships, First Kings chapter 12, verses 12 through 14, um, says this, three days after Jeroboam and all the people returned uh, here, uh, Rehoboam's decision, to hear Rehoboam's decision, just as the king had ordered, but Rehoboam spoke harshly to the people, for he rejected the advice of the older counselors and followed the counsel of the younger advisors. How many know that's already bad news, right? When you are following the younger crowd and not listening to the older crowd. Why? There's wisdom. We have to understand this. We could never, ever do away with the older generation, right? They have wisdom. They've been through some things that we've never, ever encountered in life. Uh, my kids, my kids already call me old. I'm only 43 years old, but my kids already think that I'm outdated. But what they don't know is I'm one of the best gifts that God has ever given to them. Why? Because I've been through some things in life. I see things differently. And sometimes we have the ability to dismiss our elders because we feel like they've lived their season. They don't know what's going on here. Listen, the Bible says this, there's nothing new under the sun. Things might look different, but if you strip it all down, the root is all the same. They, we, we have such, um, there, there's such a benefit in having the elders in your life, in your corner. If you could hang around some older people that have some wisdom, I promise you will get further in life than you would have just been around some of the young knuckleheads that are just going to get you into trouble. Amen? It says this. Um, so he rejected the advice of the older counselors and followed the counsel of the younger advisors. He told the people, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I am going to beat you with scorpions. Look at verse 20. It says, when the people of Israel le uh, learned of Jeroboam's return from Egypt, they called an assembly and made him king over all Israel. So only the tribe of Judah remained loyal to the family of David. Here we have such a tragedy that took place because it could have been avoided. Rehoboam, if he would have listened to the right people, the kingdom, there wouldn't have been a split in the kingdom. There, after this advice that he took from the younger people, there was a split that took place because people didn't like the advice that he was given. He was given the advice of the old, from the older people that said this, let uh, ease up on the people. Ease up, take it easy. Your dad was harsh on them, take it easy. But here, uh, Rehoboam has his friends, and they're in his ear. Listen, you're the king now. You're the man. Don't listen to these older people. You don't need to listen to them. Listen to us. Make it even harder on them. And so he does that, and it ends up splitting the kingdom and losing what he inherited, all because he listened to the wrong advice. How many know listening to the wrong advice could get you into a lot of trouble? 
Going to the wrong people could get you into a lot of trouble. Going to the wrong people could set you back years in life, could get you into even further, um, a further hole than you are in already. We need to know who to go to, not the people that just say yes, not the people say, you know what, you just do you. No, we need people in our life who are able to call out some stuff to tell you, you know what, you don't need to do that. You need to do this. Do, you know, don't listen to them. Go this direction. Stay away from there. Don't go there. We need those kind of counselors in our life. Proverbs 27, 17 says this, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. We need people that can sharpen our lives. We need people that could speak into our lives that could make us better because we all go through dull moments, right? We all go through moments where we feel dull, like we can't do anything great in life. We all go through those. Proverbs 18, 24 says this, a man of many companions may come to ruins, but there is a friend who sticks closer than any brother, right? That's Christ. He sticks closer than any brother. You see, the only number that adds nothing to your life is the number zero. The only number that could add. So if you are by yourself, you cannot get any better. You, you, you have to have people in your life. Again, going back to the book of Genesis, it says this, it is not good that man should what? Be alone. God never intended us to be alone, but he also did not intend us to be around the wrong crowd. You see, there's one thing that you get to choose. You get to choose the audience that you allow into your life. That's a choice that you make. You can't tell me, well, I was just around, you know, it, it was the people I was around. You have the ability to pull yourself out of that situation. You might look uh, like, like a fool to them. They might think that you're turning your back on them and walking away. Some of the best things that you could do is offend the people there so that you could get better in life. Why? Because all you're going to do is hold yourself back. We have to be careful who we are allowing. We need people in our lives, but more importantly, we need the right people in our lives. The right people in our lives, not just anybody. You don't just need people in your corner. You need the right people in your corner. You see, God cares deeply about who has access to your life. He cares extremely deeply about who has access to your life. You know who grants people access to your life? You do. You give permi permission to people. They, they say, you know, if, if you sit there and you take abuse, it's because you're allowing yourself to take, well, Pastor Nick, you don't know what I'm going through. Listen, it's not about what you're going through. It's about what you allow yourself to go through. You can pull yourself. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's going to be simple, a walk in the park. But you can pull yourself out of those situations. It's all in your power. When we don't set any boundaries, when we set no boundaries with people in our lives, being hurt is inevitable. You ever offend somebody and you didn't even know you offended somebody? When you offend somebody, what happens is that you just violated a boundary that you didn't even know existed. We have to learn to set boundaries in our relationships with people. How do we know when someone's violated a boundary? It's when they get offended, when they get hurt, when you strike a chord in their life. We need to set boundaries with certain people. Not everybody, I've said this before, but not everybody needs to have access to your life. You see, the problem is this, is that we've opened ourselves up, and once we get hurt, what we end up doing is we end up kicking everybody out, even the good people. It's kind of like taking an antibiotic when you're sick. An antibiotic is going to kill off the bad bacteria, but it's also going to kill off the good bacteria. When we are hurt and we get protective and we guard ourselves, what ends up happening is that we even keep the good people out of our life. But if we would learn to set boundaries, if we would learn to let people know, hey, you know what, you could only go this far. This is the only part of my life that I'm allowing you into. Other people might have deeper access into my life, but you only could go this far. When people know their boundaries, then they'll know how to operate in your life. The problem is, is that not, we're not very good at setting boundaries. We just expect everybody just to be our best friend. Not everybody's going to be your best friend. Too many of us have developed friendships with people whose purpose in life is to hold you back. It's crazy. We don't know it, but we've, we've, we've made covenant with people whose purpose in our life is to hold us back. 
How do I know that? If someone is not willing to push you forward, if someone doesn't have your best interest in life, then what they're really saying is, I'm here to hold you back. You've heard it said before that if you have a bucket of crabs, you don't have to put a lid on it because the moment that a crab tries to get to the top, the one from the bottom pulls it back down. And some of your friends are just, you got some crabby friends in life. All they're doing is pulling you back down. But because they look loyal and because they're there, loyalty doesn't mean that you always show up. Loyalty doesn't mean that you're always there. Loyalty means that you're always there, but you're helping me to get better. Some of us need to have a new definition of what loyalty is in life. It's not just that, uh, you know, that, that you're always there. We have some people that don't need to be there that are always there. I've heard it said before that no help is better than bad help. I'd rather have no friends than have bad friends in life. And so we have to learn how to set boundaries. Some friends excel in fixing things in our lives, but they feel useless when we're all fixed up and there's no more problems to fix. We have to be careful with those people because what they end up doing is they end up causing problems so that they still feel use, uh, useful in our life. It, it, it's, it's called... Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's called uh, when, when you have kind of job security, right? If I could make myself useful and you need me in life, if, if my only purpose in your life is to fix problems, I will cause problems in your life so that I have job security and I'm not going anywhere. We have to be careful. We have to, I, I, I dare you to sit down and make a list of the people that are closest to you and really get down and dirty and say, how has this person made me better? How has this person pushed me on? How has this person made me a better person in life? If you can't write down a single thing, then maybe that person hasn't made you better. Maybe they've hurt you. Maybe they've harmed you. Maybe they've, you know, they, they, they're, they're pushing you to the wrong side. We have to be careful. We have to learn to set boundaries in life. There are two types of people we all have in our life. Number one, we have people that are assigned by God. We have people who God has assigned in our life. People who God, had, they're, they're God sent. They're people who were there in a moment that you needed someone, and they weren't only there during the, during the troubled times of your life and helped you get out of the hole, but they continue to push you further in life. Those are God assigned people, people who get you better, people who challenge you, people whose life you say, you know what, I want to be like that person. Those are God assigned people in our life, people who call us when we're hurting, people who call us when we're sick, people who call us when we're not around, they notice that we're missing. Those are God assigned people because they really care about you. But then we have people who we are allow in our life by ourselves. We've invited them in. Maybe not God appointed, we've invited them in. Listen, we might not know who they are from the very get-go, but when the true colors shine forth and we still keep them around, the problem's not theirs anymore, it's ours. It is hard to break off a relationship When you've been with someone for so long, and I'm not talking about a dating relationship, I'm talking about friendships. Some of us have friends that have been there so long that you don't want to walk away because you feel like you're not going to be a loyal friend. Have they made you better or have they made you bitter? Have they made you better in life or have they made you bitter? See, we have to be more discriminating about who we allow into our lives. I love what Proverbs 4.23 says. It says, above all else, guard your heart. Your emotions, your seed of your emotions, your seed of your life. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. The moment we have heart problems is the moment that we slow down and are crippled in life. If you've ever seen someone who has heart complications, there are certain things that they can't do in the physical life. They can't, you know, um, go out and, and play certain sports. My father had a massive heart attack. He was a tennis player. He actually had a heart, he had a heart attack playing tennis, right? 
Right now, he can't get back on the tennis court because his heart is not, and he has heart complications. His life is not back to where it needs to be before. That's the physical side of it. Imagine the emotional and spiritual side when you are hurt emotionally and you are hurt spiritually by somebody. Imagine how much more you're going to be on the sidelines of life. Why? Because we did not guard our heart. See, the, the, the problem with Christians at times is this. We feel like we need to love everybody full speed, let everybody in, and give everybody a chance. Listen, we can't do that. that it, it's, it's not biblical. We're not supposed to do that. You are not supposed to just put your life out there. We need to be loving to everybody, but not everybody, again, needs to have access to your life. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So we have to be more discriminating about who we allow into our lives, who we allow access, who you allow to speak into your life, who you allow to hang out, who you go to for, um, you know, for information, for counsel. You need to be careful. Uh, not everything that shines is gold. Anybody could give you <clears throat> advice, and it could sound good in the moment, but it could be the absolute wrong advice. Just because it's wrapped up in, a good, in, in good wrappings and it sounds great doesn't mean that it's the advice that you need in that moment. You see, sometimes someone's given us a yes when God has given us an absolute no. Can I tell you this? You have to go to God for counsel first. And when people speak into your life, what they say should confirm what God says. And if there's a conflict there, always go with what God says. Our counsel should always come from the word of God. We have to understand the word of God. And when we understand that, if we have someone that speaks against that and gives us counsel, as great as it might sound, as awesome as it might sound, as, as thrilling as it might sound, if it goes against what God's word says, you automatically know that it's not of God. I love what Pastor Howard Wesley says. He says, Scripture is filled with people who missed the mark of magnificent and settled for misery of mediocrity because of the wrong people in their world. You see, one thing I love about the beginning of the school year is that everybody's a straight-A student. Everybody starts off on equal ground. Everybody's an A student when you start school. Now, those that continue to be an A student are those that put in the work and those that put in the effort, and those that don't, their A begins to turn, loses a leg pretty soon, and it becomes an F, right? And it's because they did not put in the work. We all have the ability to be amazing because that's who God's called us to be. We all have the ability to do great things in life. We all have a calling on our life. We all have the ability to touch someone's life, to change the world that we live in. We all have that ability, and those who do have fulfilled what God has called them to do. But those who don't oftentimes have been um, messed up and, and hurt because maybe they've allowed the wrong person into their life. I love what Pastor Matt used to say when he was the youth pastor here. He used to say, the greatest thing that will ever tear down a young person is a relationship. You can't compete with a relationship especially when that individual doesn't want you to come to church. If anything is pulling you away from God, run, right? That is the number one red flag. If anything is pulling you, but I love them. Listen, you don't love them as much as God loves you, right? Nothing should pull you away from God. Nothing should pull you away from your, your relationship here and what God's doing. Again, uh, some people have settled for, um, for misery and mediocrity because of the wrong people in their world. I look at people like Samson, had a calling on his life from a young baby. Before he was even born, his parents knew that he was going to be amazing in life. And all he had to do was live life according to how God called him to live life. But he had a problem. He had a Delilah in his life. He had a problem with women. And because of that, the Bible says that he lost his power. He had a calling, just like all of us. He had the ability to do great, and he did great. But he had a problem. He had the wrong people around him. You look at different people in the word of God, and it happens. King Solomon, the, the wisest man ever, had, um, had elders to guide his life, documented the, ne the necessities of counsel, yet he's unable to pass that on to his own son, right? We see that King Solomon, his son Rehoboam, is the one who, who split the kingdom. 
His father was the wisest man in the world. You would think that his son would catch on to that counsel, but something happened in the transferring, not only of power, but in the transferring of counsel. I don't know how great of a father that Solomon was. We don't know that. We've all seen people who have had great parents, but maybe those great parents didn't spend great time with their children, and now their children come out different, and the people are asking, how did that take place? How did that happen? You have such amazing parents. Uh, Amazing parents doesn't always mean that the kids are going to be amazing if they're not spending time with their kids and investing into them. We see it all the time. King Solomon was wise but made some foolish choices towards the end of his life. His unhealthy relationships opened up the doors for his downfall. Why do you think your parents always tried their hardest to keep you away from the wrong crowd? When I was growing up, I thought my dad's favorite word was no. (laughs) Dad, can I spend the night at my friend's house? No. Why not? Because I pay a lot of money to provide a roof over your head and a bed in your room so that you can sleep on it. What he was really saying, he wasn't saying, no, he didn't want me to be around my friends. What he was really saying was, listen, there's things that I don't know that's going on in that family or in that person. And if they influence you, it could take you out. And I'm not going to allow that to take place. So he would always say, no, because if I was in his care and under his covering, he knew that he could watch over my life and steer me in the right direction. That's what they did. They were trying to get us to the right place. God was displeased with Solomon, so he allowed three enemies to rise up against him, one of them which was named Jeroboam. So the Bible says Jeroboam flees to Egypt and returns after Solomon dies. And Jeroboam gives Rehoboam advice uh, to take it easy on the people, but he refuses to listen. So Rehoboam uh, rejects counsel of the elders and instead listens to his friends that he grew up with made a mistake. He's listening to the youngsters on how to run a kingdom when it was the older people that have been there with his father and even his grandfather that knew what it took to run the kingdom. He didn't want to listen. Why? Because the old people didn't have anything that he needed when the older people had everything that he needed. Right? You might look at somebody and they might not look the part. They might not look cool. My kids say, I don't look cool. Right? But Anthony says I look cool. So I'll, I'll go with that right there. Right? They, they, they might think, oh, you know, you're outdated. Right? My son sometimes thinks I was born in the 1900s. Dad, when you were young, did they have phones? Like, man, how old do you think I really am here, kid? Right? They think you're outdated. You don't understand what we're going through. You don't know. Listen, it's a different time, but it's the same stuff. Right? I have things that you need in life, and if you would listen to me, right? but that's the problem is sometimes we feel like the people that are assigned to us are the very ones that are trying to hold us back. As a result of Rehoboam and, and all this happening, the nation is split. <clears throat> the wrong people in your life at critical moments can cause you to make foolish decisions, decisions that end up costing you everything. When you have to make a critical decision who do you call? Once you think of that, who's your go-to person? When you have to make a big decision, who's your go-to person? Anybody want to blurt it out real quick? <laughs> Pastor Cat, Pastor Dan? Okay, chat. Okay. Right, Jesus? God? Right? We all have to have somebody that we run to. And if you say, well, I just take care of it by myself, well, then you're already in trouble, (laughs) right? Because you're stuck already. You need someone to give you counsel in life, okay? Rehoboam's destiny was to rule, but because because he was uh, surrounded by wrong people, he lost everything. We need our ride or dies, but you will not be successful if you surround yourself with people who only say yes to you. If all you have is yes men in your life, You're in trouble. If you don't have a friend that's offended you because they went against what you thought, you don't have a good friend. The Bible says that faithful are the wounds of a good friend. You're going to tell me what I need to hear, not always what I want to hear. A good friend's going to tell you what you need to hear, not always what you want to hear. 
Okay, it's not about having the wrong people in our lives. We need to focus on having the right people in our lives. So there's six people that we need in our lives, and tonight we're only going to cover three of them. Number one, we all need a comforter. We all need someone who comforts us. We all need a mama in life, right? You're, you, usually your mom's going to, if you have your mom, usually your mom's going to be your comforter. Yeah, help, where you, help where you are hurting at, okay? Everyone needs someone because life will hurt you. We need someone that's going to comfort us. We need someone that could pick us back up. We need someone that could bandage our wounds. We need someone that could give us chicken noodle soup when we're feeling sick spiritually, right? We need those people in our life because life is going to hurt. A comforter helps us heal where we hurt. They allow us to be human and vulnerable. We need a comforter in our life. Comforters, they're real without being judgmental. Right? They love you. A comforter loves you. They're in your life. They comfort you. Comforters hear your junk, and they still love you through it. Right? You need a comforter in life. They're real without being judgmental. They listen with belief. They believe in you. They want to see you get back up. They don't want to see you fall. You, you know, they're not the one who's kicking you when you're down. They're helping you back up. They speak life to you. Right? They speak life to you. They believe in you. I can't make it. Don't say that to yourself. You can make it. You're more than a conqueror. We need those comforters in life. They're the people that when you leave their presence, you feel like, man, okay, everything's going to be all right. We need the comforter. They shut their mouths when you're all done. They speak, and they don't tell it to other people. They comfort you. They're there to help you up. Okay? Without a comforter, we, we react out of feelings, not facts. When we don't have a comforter who's, who's picking us back up, who's real with us without being judgmental, we react, we react out of feelings and not facts. We will expect the one who hurt you to heal you if we don't have a comforter. If someone is the problem, they can't be the solution. Right? If we don't have the comforter, we often will go to the person. That's why the, you know, the, the young lady who's being abused by a man, after he abuses her, and he comes over and says, I'm sorry. He begins to comfort her. He just hurt her, but then she, beg she begins to believe because she doesn't have a comforter outside of that. We need someone outside of that who could comfort us, who could speak life to us, that could tell us, listen, you don't, belong, you don't need to be treated like that. Right? They're, 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 they're speaking life. They're picking us back up. Number two, we need someone who's a confronter. We don't like confronters, but we need a confronter. Loves you enough to correct you. This isn't a friend that you like to have, but this is a friend that you need to have. Someone who is real with you. Someone, you know, the, the person that's not afraid to tell you when you got broccoli stuck in your teeth. Someone who's not afraid to say, man, did you brush your teeth today? Because your breath really, really smells right now. Right? We need a confronter. Because confronters, um, they might not always be right, but we need them in our life. The goal of a confronter is to lead you to repentance. King David had a confronter, and his name was Nathan. Right? Confronting is not easy. I don't... Maybe some of you love confrontation. I hate confrontation, but I know that it's needed in life, right? Sometimes you have to have hard conversations with people. When you're close to somebody, you have to have a hard conversation with somebody because they did something that was absolutely ridiculous, and you got to call them into the office and sit down and, what's going on, Pastor Nick? Well, you tell me what's going on. <laughs> what do you mean? You know what? You know I know, Right? Uh, we, we need those people, right? A, a confronter, though, shouldn't be a destroyer, right? Nathan confronts King David. He tells the king, the one who could have had Nathan killed, he tells the king this story about a lamb and someone taking someone's only lamb, and David gets so mad, tell me who that person is, and Nathan says, it's you, right? When he took Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, and then had Uriah killed, he confronts the king, and he brings the king to a place of repentance because that's the place of a comforter. Or, not, or, 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 or yeah, uh, uh, of a confronter is to bring you to a place of repentance in life. Listen, I love you too much to allow you to stay here. 
I'm not going to, if you're going to continue down that path, then I'm going to have to remove myself from your life. I'm just being real with you. But if you want to change, and this is what you're going to have to do, you're going to have to go and apologize for the thing you said. I don't need to apologize. You're going to have to go and apologize for the thing you said or did to that person because you were absolutely wrong. Or when you're a hothead in a conversation, you're talking, and you don't think you're a hothead, but the confronter comes up and says, what's your problem, man? You got attitude today. I ain't got attitude. You got a whole lot of attitude. What you need to do is you need to go make it right with that person because you just shattered a whole lot of relationship that you took this long to build up. And if you want to allow it to do that, then you go ahead and you, you help yourself and go your own way. But if you're going to make this right or you're going to continue on here, you're going to have to make that right first. It's the confronter. We don't like them, but we need them. His goal is to lead you to repentance. When we refuse to be confronted, you will always have conflict. Some of us don't like to admit that we're wrong. Listen, I understand admitting that you're wrong hurts. Eating humble pie and swallowing your pride is not easy, especially when you think that you're right, especially when you've always been right, but most of the time you've been wrong. Right? You just had people around you that were too afraid to tell you that you were wrong. So you thought you were right, but now God brought someone into your life who's not afraid of you, who when you bark, they're like, listen, you're all bark and no bite. Listen, you aren't threatening to me, so you could, you could put the show you know, o- over there. Let, let's let it go. You were wrong. Okay, We need those people in our life. When God says someone like that, it'll humble you real quick because you know you can't get away with anything at all, but they bring you to a place of repentance. We all need those people. If you don't have those people in life, you're probably the one that thinks you're always right, but most of the time you're wrong. And what, we, and what ends up happening is this, is that people will be around you because they have to. But the moment they don't have to be around you anymore, they won't. And we usually see it with kids to their parents. When they're under their roof, if they have a very dominating father who, who doesn't listen to them at all or a very dominating mother, as soon as that child is old enough to leave the house, they will leave and they will not make their way back. But I'll tell you what does restore that is asking for forgiveness. Eating a piece of humble pie to say, listen, I've done some things wrong. I've noticed I've done things wrong. You've told me I've done things wrong. And I take responsibility for that. It's healing the relation. That is such a hard thing to do, especially when you're a hothead and you're prideful and you didn't grow up with someone telling you that they were sorry. I say this all the time. Just because you didn't get it doesn't mean you can't give it. Let's cancel, let's cancel out all the excuses of why we can't. If we're confronted with something and we're wrong, hey, you know, let's take responsibility and let's make it right. Okay? The confronter steps, in, steps into your, your private space. Right? They get into your business. Right? They're not afraid of you. They get into your business. Uh, will comfort you privately with no threat of publicity. Yeah, I don't, you don't need someone to, to comfort or to, or to confront you, and then all of a sudden they put it on Facebook. Can you imagine what so-and-so did? I can't believe them. And da, 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 da. No, they, they, they do it in confidence. And because they do it in confidence and, 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 they, and they do it privately, you know that they love you. You know that they love you. Love, they love you enough to warn you. 1 Corinthians 5, 9, and 11 says this, When I wrote to you before, I told you, uh, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or are greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You would have, you would have to leave the world to avoid those people. Right? When we read the words, sometimes we're, we look at the world like, i got to stay away. No, Paul's warning them about people in the church. Okay, saying you need to stay away from people, these people in the church. It says, I meant that you are not to associate with, associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual, sexual sin or is greedy or worships idols or is abusive or is a drunkard or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. So Paul says, if they say they're in the church and they say that they're a believer, he says, and they don't want to change that stuff, don't associate with them. 
Okay? So the goal, again, of the confronter isn't exposure, but repentance. Okay? The last person we need in life is we need a challenger. Okay? Examples of growth. A, challenger's, uh, a challenger, um, a challenger uh, gets godliness gets on your nerves. The closer they get to God, the more scriptures that they know, the, 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 the deeper they go in their walk with God, they challenge you to the point where it irritates you. You know what I'm talking about? Especially if you're in the home because you have all these different dynamics. Some of you are at level 10. Some of you are at level 1. And those that are at level 10 probably irritate those that are level 1, not because they're trying to irritate you, but because they've gotten so far and you're not there yet. I want to get to there. Their life challenges you. You need those people in life. That's why we need to stop hanging around people who are just equal to us or we're better than them in life because then we feel just great about ourselves. We need to hang around people who make us want to do more and go further because their life is challenging to us. That's who we need to hang around, okay? Challengers, uh, examples of of growth, uh, they challenge you to get better, get better financially, right? If you're married, you need a, a marriage that challenges you to get better. You ever see a husband that is just like, he's on his game. Like he knows everything. And then your wife's looking at you like, how come you can't do that? Right? It's not that he's trying to do that. That's just who he is. Right? So his life is challenging you as a husband or maybe a wife, a a wife is just on her game. And the husband looks at the wife and says, how come you can't cook? How come you can't do these things? How come you can't? It, it, it's, it's a challenge. It's not that they meant to do that. We need those people in life who challenge us. If you're a young adult, you need someone who, who challenges you in life to get better, to go further, that, that's going to school. Well, you know, I signed up for school. Listen, don't give me the excuses. Just follow through with the plan. Follow through with the plan. They challenge you to get better. The Word of God doesn't just reveal God's standards, but it also exposes our deficiencies in life as well, okay? Get around people who are better than you in various areas of life. You need to have people who are better than you in various areas of life. People, if you're a singer, someone who sings better than you. If you're a preacher, someone who preaches better than you. If you're a musician, someone who plays better than you. Um, Whatever it might be, if you're a carpenter, hang around someone who could build things that just, man, will take you years to get to that level. Why? Because you learn something from them that you could have never learned from the books or from going to school. They challenge you to get better. We need those people in our lives. Life that challenge us to get better. When you see someone that always comes up to the altar, don't look at them and judge them. They've got a lot of issues. No, they're seeking after God because they want to get better. Maybe you should be on your knees right beside them going after God just like them. Or you see someone who's in worship and they're, they're going and they're crying. You're like, man, they're always so emotional in church. Maybe you should try it sometimes so that you can have the breakthrough that they're having in life. It challenges us to get better. I love to be challenged as a man or as a father when I see a father that's doing things that make me just look like, man, you're just, you're just surface level, kid. Why? Because it makes me want to get to that level. It challenges me to get better. The problem is a lot of us don't like challenges because then it takes away of our excuses of why we should stay the same. Right? When you see someone who's getting buff, and I look at June, June challenges me. And I don't think they make a shirt big enough to fit his, around his arms. He, he, he challenges me. Why? Because I, I see him constantly working hard. Listen, we could all have a desire, but unless you put in the work, you are not going to have the results. You could desire a greater relationship with God, but unless you put in the work, you're not going to get the results. You could desire to be a better parent, but unless you put in the work, you're not going to get the results. A husband, a wife, you're not, unless you, a desire means nothing unless you put in the work to get it. Challengers push us to new levels of godliness and excellence. They push us to a level to get better. See, they're not our competition. They're not trying to compete with you because they're too busy trying to get further in life themselves. So as I close tonight, I want to close with this question. Who do you have in your life that's challenging you to 
to get better today. If you don't got somebody, find somebody. Like I said, let's kill the excuses of why we can't. We all have them. Some of us choose to use them, and some of us are choosing to kill them. We could all give reasons of why we can't. I could never get clean. I could never be a great husband. I could never be a great wife. I could never be close to God like other people are. Listen, they're all excuses. That's all they are. They're, they're excuses, but when you put in the work, you could do whatever you put your mind to. Whatever you put your heart to, when, 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 you, when you put in the work, you, you want more of God? Hey, you know what? It's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take sacrifice. You're going to have to get up early, and you're going to have to pray. It's, it's going to take sacrifice, but you know what? It's possible. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me tonight. We all need people in our life that cause us to get better. We need a comforter, someone that's going to help us when we're hurting. We need a confronter, someone that's not afraid to tell it like it is. Then we also need that challenger in life, someone whose life is just somewhere we want to be. You're, you're here tonight. Maybe you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've never asked him into your heart. Or maybe you have and you're just not close with God. And you look and you see the joy that other people have and you want it so bad. Well, this is the first step in getting it. It's a challenge to you tonight. You want a better life. You, 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 you want to give up some stuff. You want to walk away. You, you, you want a fresh start. You want peace in your life. It, it starts here. This, this is where it starts at. So you hear you've never accepted Christ, or maybe you have, and you're just not living right right now. You feel far from God. If that's you, I'm just going to ask you to raise up your hand. Anyone at all. Amen. 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 Secondly is this, you're, you're done with the excuses, you just want to get better. And tonight you're going to humble yourself and you're going to say, Pastor Nick, I'm going to invite the right people into my life, I'm going to find a comforter, I'm going to find a, a, a confronter, and I'm going to find a challenger. Because I want to get better, I desire to get better I, at whatever it costs me. Whatever it costs me, I'm going to go after it. If that's you here tonight, you're done with the excuses. You say, if I want it, I have to put it in the work, and I'm willing to put it in the work. I'm going to ask you just to raise up your hand tonight as well. Amen, 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 amen. Listen, if you raise your hand for any of those calls, I'm going to ask you to come forward. I want to pray with you, the prayer team, the pastors. We want to pray with you, believe with you. But you got to put in the work. You raise your hand for salvation, rededicate your heart. Or if you're saying, you know what, I'm done with the excuses. I need people in my life. I'm committing to get people in my life, but I'm also committed to get the wrong people out of my life. Come on, if you raise your hand, just make your way up. It's the first step. It's the first step. For those that raise their hands to commit their heart to the Lord or rededicate their heart, the Bible says this, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again, then salvation's yours. So I'm going to ask everyone at the sound of my voice, if you would repeat this prayer with me, say, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and you're the Savior. Tonight, I confess you as Lord and Savior of my life. I believe that you died on the cross. And that you rose again three days later. I pray that you would forgive me of the things I've done that have broken your heart. Help me in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, we're going to pray with you as Pastor Sepha sings. We're going to pray with you because as hard as it might be to get some people out of our life and bring some people into our life, 
is needed. You need a comforter, a confronter, and you need a challenger. And we're going to pray just those things over your life tonight. I want to say thank you so much for joining us at service today. Being part of our online campus means that you are part of CWC Bay Area, and we value you so much. Do us a favor. If you could hit subscribe so you don't miss any of our future messages, and then share this message with other people that you think would be blessed by it as well. We love you here at CWC Bay Area, and until we see you again, remember, love God, love people, and let's change the world.